Hello everybody and welcome to our English service today at Salem and a warm welcome not only to those of you who are with us on Zoom but also to those of you who are watching this afterwards on YouTube and I think we will do what we did a couple of weeks ago and let's give a wave to everybody who's not here but watching it later just to say we love you and we miss you. And a particular wave this morning, if you get to watch this soon, Irene, to Irene, who mm -hmm. um, has been in hospital over the weekend. And just to say that we love you and we're praying for you. So today we're celebrating the first Sunday of Lent. And this year, more than ever, perhaps, I'm not sure whether celebrate is the best word to use. Lent is a time of sacrifice, isn't it? And I think all of us have kind of had enough of making sacrifices this year. Lent is the traditional time when we have to give up something. But we've had to give up so much against our wills over the last 12 months or so. And I think it's important at the start of Lent this year for us to acknowledge this in the presence of God. So I have asked people I hope you got the message to prepare an outline of a hand drawn on a piece of paper. If you haven't got the message, you can rush and get a piece of paper now and a pen and very quickly draw around your hand. So I'll keep talking for a couple of seconds to give you time to do that. And what I'd like you to do now is to think about all the things that you've had to give up against your will over the last year. So maybe holidays, maybe seeing members of your family whom you love, perhaps birthday parties, or weddings, perhaps it was going swimming that you've missed, perhaps you've actually lost somebody you love this year, maybe you weren't even able to go to their funeral. Maybe it's a smaller thing. Maybe you really miss going to the cinema or the theatre or a concert. Maybe it's the Eisteddfod, the National Eisteddfod that you really missed last year. Perhaps it was just going out for coffee with a friend. The truth is, whatever it is, big or small, God cares about it. And so I'd just like to invite us now, during this time of lament at the beginning of Lent, I'm going to play a song which reminds us of God's faithfulness. And I invite you to write on your piece of paper. No one else is going to see this. It's going to be private, just between you and God. The things that you have lost because of COVID over the last year. And offer them up to God who sees and loves and cares. And during that time, I'm going to play a hymn. And uh, feel free, please, to sing along. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been. Thine own dear prayer 
presence to cheer and to guide a strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see nor i have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness lord unto me great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see nor i have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness lord unto me let's take all those things that you wrote on the hand Let's just place them before God. He is the God of great faithfulness, who walks with us through the good times and the bad. And let us pray. Loving, faithful God, your love is absolute. Your promises irrevocable. Your love and your faithfulness never come to an end. We look up after a shower of rain and we marvel at the colourful beauty of your rainbow. A reminder of your promise and your faithfulness to all generations. Wherever we happen to be today, whether we're on top of a mountain at the bottom of a valley or in the wilderness of the desert your holy spirit is with us we adore you loving faithful god amen our bible reading today is actually extremely short and so what we're going to do is i'm going to invite you to use your imagination and start off by looking at this picture. <clears throat> now, this is a picture of the Jordan River where people today go to be baptized. And I'd just like to imagine you in that picture. Who are you? Are you one of those people in the river? who's already been baptized? Can you feel your wet clothes clinging to you as the sunshine is blazing down ahead? Are you perhaps one of those people in the queue waiting to get into that water? Or you may be one of the people holding the camera on the side. How do you feel? What can you hear? And as you do that, I invite you, if you wish, to close your eyes and to listen 
to the first bit of our reading today. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. But you now, if you will, to open your eyes and have a look at the screen. And once again, I invite you to imagine yourself in that picture. It's very, very hot. There's no shade in sight. Perhaps your eyes hurt from the glare. The sand is burning through your feet. So you can feel it coming through. How do you feel? Is that a snake under Jesus' head? Are there wild animals there? Are you afraid or are you just interested? Are you thirsty? Hungry? I invite you now to close your eyes if you haven't done so already and I'll read you the second part of our reading. Immediately after Jesus's baptism, the spirit drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts. And the angels waited on him. I invite you to open your eyes and uh, rejoin us in the room as it were and if anything struck you as you were uh, imagining yourself in those scenes feel free to put it in the chat or on the Salem Facebook page or the WhatsApp group you're part of whatever later don't don't let that go if God spoke to you at that moment <clears throat> now I remember when our oldest son Josh was only one and we decided we were going to go on a walking and camping holiday. It was a little bit ambitious, but we didn't realize it at the time. So Francis and I prepared an enormous rucksack each. And when we started packing, I started to put on our bed everything I thought we were going to need for the journey. Tent, of course, big tent. There's two of us and a baby. Clothes. Oh, we're going to need to eat. So a little cooker, gas cylinder, matches, nappies, baby food, spoon, special cup to drink from, cutlery, tea, coffee, small kettle, milk, food, toys, torch, raincoats just in case and scarf and hat and uh, sun hats just in case and sun cream books because everybody knows you can't go on holiday without books walking boots sleeping bags pajamas in the end we had to be realistic it was abundantly clear it was going to be completely impossible to go on a walking holiday carrying all of that on our backs as well as carrying young Josh who'd only just started to walk. And so we had a choice to make. We had to choose between leaving virtually everything behind and doing the original journey that we had planned or taking the car. And we took the car. 
<laughs> now, when you and I respond to the call of Jesus to follow him, you and I also are carrying so many things on our backs. We're carrying the scars and the memories of what's happened in our past. We're carrying our selfishness and our sin. We're carrying our hopes as well as our fears for the future. Often we don't realize what an enormous rucksack we're carrying on our backs, but the burden is there. And like the Hunt family hoping to go on a, a walking and camping holiday, it's actually not possible to follow Jesus when carrying all these burdens. They're just too heavy for the adventure that Jesus is inviting us to follow. And so we also have to choose. We have to choose between following Jesus in freedom or carrying on with our burdens and refusing that invitation to the journey with Jesus. But it's not easy to get rid of those burdens, even if we actually want to. And so through the years, the church has kept the, the period of Lent every year as a time when we can learn to get rid of these burdens, when we can learn to travel more lightly. If we think back to that uh, camping trip that the Hunt family did for a minute, why do you think that I wanted to take so much stuff? It was because I was worried about what might happen. As parents, Francis and I were responsible for everything. And so we had to prepare for every eventuality, for every weather. And in fact, Josh ended up getting chicken pox on this uh, particular holiday. So you actually do never know what's going to happen along the way. But just imagine for a minute, if I'd asked Josh, one year old Josh, to pack his own bag, what would he have packed? Well, I can tell you what he would have packed. He would have packed his little teddy called Noemi, because we live in France. And he would have packed a little digger, which went with him everywhere. And that would have been it. Josh wouldn't have packed any clothes or any food. Why not? Because he knew that was mum and dad's problem. He could trust us to keep him safe and warm and well fed. And there's a parallel between that and the journey which Jesus invites us on. Jesus says to us, you don't need to carry your burdens of yesterday's pain and today's sin and tomorrow's fears. You can just let them go because God loves you so much. It is safe to leave these burdens in God's hands and to follow Jesus in freedom because you and I are God's beloved children. The very first step in letting go all the burdens which slow us down is to believe that you and I are God's beloved children. It's that belief which gives us the strength to get rid of our burdens, of our fears and our sins, which stop us from living a free life the life of the disciple of Jesus. And that brings us back to the first part of our reading today, because God, after Jesus is baptized and he comes up from the waters, God says to Jesus, you are my beloved son and I delight in you or in you I am well pleased, according to the translation. You see, Jesus at this point of his baptism has made the decision of starting his public ministry. And in order to do this, Jesus needs to give up so many things to let go of them. Jesus needs to let go of his life at home with his mother and his siblings. He needs to let go of his job as a carpenter. He needs to let go of the security of living in a house. Perhaps Jesus also needs to let go of those everyday hopes that a 30 year old man might have of being married, of having children, of growing old, of seeing his grandchildren. 
If Jesus is to obey the call that God has placed on his life, Jesus must let go of his fears for the future because he is called to go faithfully to the cross. And this is so hard to do. And so God says to Jesus the words that Jesus needs to hear. If Jesus is to be able to lay down these burdens and depend completely on his father. God says to him, you are my beloved son and I delight in you. It's this knowledge that is the source of Jesus's strength. It's this knowledge that is the source of Jesus's ability to get rid of everything that stops him from following Jesus. This knowledge that he is God's beloved son. And exactly the same thing is true of you and me today. You and I are God's beloved children and God delights in us. And it's this knowledge that gives us the power to get rid of the things that are stopping us from following Jesus. The author of the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 12 says this, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. During Jesus' baptism, Jesus, God says those all important words to Jesus. You are my son, the beloved. And it's worthwhile us looking a little bit closer at the source of these words, because you are my son. This is actually a quotation from Psalm 2. And in Psalm 2, God appoints his king to govern over the whole world. But the other nations of the world do not accept the authority of God's king. This is what the psalm says. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. But the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance. So this is the context of God's words to Jesus at his baptism. You are my son. God is recognizing Jesus. He's acknowledging him publicly as the Messiah the king that was to come. But what sort of king? And in order to understand that, we have to look at the second half of what God says to Jesus at his baptism. You are my son and with you I am well pleased. I delight in you. Because this bit, I delight in you, is actually a reference to Isaiah 42, the song of the suffering servant. And in this chapter from Isaiah, God describes his beloved servant by saying this. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. In other words, God appoints Jesus as his king, but not as the king who destroys but the king who brings justice, not as the king who depends on his own power and his own army and his own strength. Because in actual fact, depending on ourselves is a huge burden for you and me to carry. No, God appoints Jesus as the great king who depends entirely on God. The king who travels with an empty rucksack, as it were. Now, depending on God like that is not easy. 
It's much easier for you and me to depend on the things that we can see and touch. Things such as food and money, for instance. And Jesus knows this. So immediately after Jesus is acknowledged, is recognized by God. And just before he begins his public ministry, there's a sort of gap in the middle where Jesus goes to the desert for 40 days to fast in order to learn how to depend on God alone. And through the years, Christians have also practiced disciplines such as fasting. And why is that? It's because when you and I say no to the ordinary things that we depend on, things such as food, for instance, or coffee, we are saying to, to God, I want to depend only on you. It's exactly like going on that camping holiday and taking things out of your rucksack and believing that God will fulfill every one of our needs on the way. But pay careful attention to the order in which Jesus does things. Jesus doesn't fast in order to please God, in order to win God's favour. That's really important. Jesus already knows that God loves him. He already knows he's the beloved. He already knows he's the son in whom God delights because God told him. Jesus fasts in order to, as it were, empty his rucksack, in order to get rid of everything that's stopping him from going on that journey to which God has called him, everything that's stopping him from obeying God. Jesus fasts in order uh, that for 40 days he can concentrate completely on God. And this is why Christians fast during Lent. Not to lose weight, not in order to gain God's favour, because God already loves us. We already have his favour. Christians don't fast in order to pay some kind of penance for our sins. Jesus has done that already. Jesus has paid the cost for your sins and my sins when he died on the cross. Now, we fast in order to remind ourselves that we do not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. We fast in order to get rid of our everyday routine and in order to clear space and time to be for God, with God. In order to remind ourselves again of the command in Hebrews to run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, throwing off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And so as beloved children of God, as part of our journey as disciples of Jesus this Lent, if we want to be free of the burdens of worrying about the past and the future, if we want to be free to follow Jesus properly and seriously, perhaps we could try fasting from time to time. Now, I suggest that you start by thinking about the kind of fast that you might uh, make, because there's all sorts of different things that you can fast from. It doesn't have to be food. It could be alcohol, it could be tea or coffee. It could be Facebook. It could be watching television. It could be for an hour a day. It could be for a day a week. It could just be as a one off. But the important thing is the motive. It's why we're doing it. And so don't choose something that you already wanted to do, like don't stop eating chocolate because you want to lose weight. Don't choose something that you should already be stopping, such as don't say, oh, I'm not going to gossip during Lent. You shouldn't be gossiping anyway. Choose something in your life that is competing with God for your attention. Remember how much God loves you. And just in private, just between you and God, say, loving Heavenly Father, I am going to today for instance, not drink coffee, just to show you that I really love you and I want to learn to depend completely on you. Can I add here the usual proviso that 
if you're physically unwell or if you struggle with, for instance, anxiety, fasting may not be the thing for you. So please don't feel guilty if that's the case. Remember, the key thing here is that God loves you and you are his beloved child, whether or not you fast. But over the years, when Christians have practiced fasting like this, they have found that it's easier for them to leave their burdens in God's hands and to carry on on the journey of following Jesus. Now, if you are a fan of football, and I say to you, the hand of God, that probably only means one thing. Um, it will mean uh, Diego Maradona in the World Cup in 1986 against England. But there's something I'd like to show you, and unfortunately I've lost it, but fear not, it's gonna come back. <laughs> I want to show you a picture of three sculptures which are all entitled The Hand of God. So I'm going to share my screen. There we go. And I hope that you can now see on your screens three sculptures of the hand of God. And whether or not you intend to fast, and some of you will and some of you won't, and that's absolutely fine. There is a, an exercise I'd like to encourage us all to do right now. Have a look at these three sculptures. They're three different ways in which three different artists have interpreted the hand of God. And maybe there's one of them there that speaks to you and that you can identify with. And I'd just like us to take a moment in the quiet for you to put those burdens that you're carrying into God's hand. Just a chance for you, as it were, to empty that rucksack in the presence of God. So let's do, do that now, just in a moment of silence. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave thy courts above. Take my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Let's uh, sing together. Come thou fount of every blessing. Yeah. 
Let us pray. Beloved Lord Jesus, you stepped from water to wilderness, from God's voice to the taunting voice of the enemy. In the wilderness of today's world, we face many enemies, many temptations. Forgive us for succumbing to selfishness, greed, lust, anger, and power. Lord, sometimes difficult times follow fast on the heels of one another, and it's hard to keep our focus on you. Forgive us and help us to remember your promises and to recognize you in those you bring alongside us. Lord, forgive us when our minds fail to focus on you and your word. Help us to remember that no matter what we're going through, you've been there before us. Whether we're swimming in the warm waters of your love or journeying through the arid wilderness, help us not to lose sight of your hand, guiding us to eternal glory at rainbow's end. Lord Most High, forgive us, we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, as we journey through Lent, we remember that you went from water to wilderness to suffering on the cross. There, you, beloved Son of God, died for our sins. 
Through your blood, we are washed clean of all our guilt. And now we're able to enter the presence of God with whom you now sit, having been raised in the spirit. All angels, powers and authorities submit to you. Because of you, we are forgiven. Praise be to Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. We thank you, faithful Lord, for your patience, provision and power. For your tenderness, trust and triumph. For your security and strength for your compassion and wisdom. We thank you, Lord, that through your grace and mercy, the blessings of faith and your covenant love, you equip, teach and guide us as we traverse today's world, ever mindful of your steadfast love. As we walk into the long weeks of Lent, we begin a journey into the wilderness. May your spirit rest upon us. We travel from suffering to hope. May your spirit rest upon us. We travel through death to new life. May your spirit rest upon us. As we look to the example of Jesus, who in the wilderness chose the difficult path, help us to know that you are with us. Though the way ahead may be hard, and so often we falter and fail, strengthen us for the journey ahead and teach us to trust in you. We walk in relative security, thankful for the comforts we know. And so we pray for today for people who can't afford to work from home and ask that we would address the inequality this shows us. We pray for people in homes that are unsafe. We remember especially those living in life-threatening icy weather in central and southern US. We ask that our church communities can offer hope and safety for those in distress, that we might share what we have and work to lift the burden that others carry. As we look to the example of Jesus, who embraced all who were in pain, may we also reach out to others in generosity and kindness. As we walk in our troubled world, we are full of anxiety at the conflict we see. For the oppressed Uyghur people in China, for Iraq and Iran, for the Sahel region, Myanmar, Somalia and Yemen. Bring your peace to these places, we pray. We are aware of the finite resources of our earth. Help us to limit our destructive habits. As we look to the example of Jesus who lived in simplicity and trust, as you ask us again to follow him, may we free ourselves from everything that holds us back and trust in your promise that you will never leave us. Lord, you know that in these days of pandemic, we walk in separation apart from friends and those we love. Please give us strength to endure in hope. We pray especially for all who are burdened by loneliness, for all who are in pain, for the bereaved and the despairing, for the sick and the dying. Please help us to make our communities places of warmth and friendship where all are included and each one finds a place. As we look to the example of Jesus, who welcomed the last, the least and the lost and brought the overlooked into the light, so may we too extend our circle of belonging and believe that your love is big enough for all to enter in. As we walk in hope for a future, as the rollout of the vaccine continues across the UK, 
we give thanks for the work of the NHS as they administer vaccines to the public and manage long lists of people needing urgent surgery. Lord, we pray for countries yet to begin vaccination and for countries who cannot afford the vaccines. And we ask that governments would enable a fair distribution. When we begin to emerge from crisis, may we work to build a better world where the poorest are protected. As we look to the example of Jesus who placed such great value on children, may we create a space where the young can dream again and all of us can grow and rest and be secure. In love you made us, in love you call us, in love you lead us through this world, through sorrow and joy, until we see you face to face. Your kingdom comes near to those who call on your name, your pathway is surrounded by love. Teach us to walk in it. And we pray now using the words that your son taught us as we say, our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Just before I hand over to Paula, we are going to sing our final hymn. It's a beautiful hymn written last year, um, deliberately chosen because it talks about walking through the wilderness. Pray. 
Thank you, Paula. Uh, thank you for your message this morning, Rosa, uh, where we're invited to let go in order to follow God. And we can do, do so because we are loved. And thanks to everybody who's joined us for this service of worship this morning. Uh, well, for coming up this week, as usual, we'll have LG tomorrow at 5.30, prayer breakfast on Friday morning at 8 a.m. and guitar practice with Maestro Andrew Johnson at 9.30 on Saturday. And next Sunday at 10.30, we will have Martin Gillard. He will be leading the service. Um, we think it's by Zoom, but I'll find out as soon as I possibly can. And uh, we'll put a message in Helen Eads' newsletter and uh, also on Facebook too, okay? So we'll make sure we get a message to you somehow. So that's Martin Gillard at 10.30 next week. Now, a very important announcement. Our own very lovely Andrew Parker is appearing on Radio Wales's celebration programme this evening at 7.28 precisely. That's what I've been given, the information I've been given anyway. And he's talking about his favourite hip. Now, some of us caught it uh, over Christmas time when he did the last celebration programme. It was very interesting indeed. So he's on again tonight, 728, Celebration Radio Wales. A star is born. So now I'm going to prepare to share my screen. So this either means it'll work or it's more editing for Rosa before she puts it on YouTube. And uh, what I want to show you is um, lovely Molly. Now I try to do so, as you know. So and my, uh, my computer suddenly collapsed. So hopefully everything will go well. Now, as you know, every week I send out a resource pack to 18 children as we don't have Sunday school at the moment. And there are loads of things you can do from the resource pack. And, uh, you know, most of it, the children can do on its own, but it's a lovely way of getting the family involved actually. So lovely Molly, this pack has gone all the way to Nottingham. Um, lovely Molly, Molly, a couple of weeks ago, did a few things on the wedding of Cana. So here she is. She's doing the taste test. So there she is. I think it's got a bit of orange juice there and a bit of raspberry, I think. And then there's Molly completing one of the worksheets. All right. So well done, Molly. Um, and then this week. Uh, Ollie and his sister Lucy did a couple of things on the woman at the well, the woman of Samaria. So uh, first of all, they did some, um, oh right, some water, oh there we go. So they filled some glasses with water and had to make a tune out of it. There we go. Ollie, of course, you know, had a little bit of a moan about his sister's tempo and tone, but there we go. And then we would remember the woman filling the jars of water. So there was a bit of a competition going on here between brother and sister, trying to fill each other's glasses or their own glasses. Right, with so bits we're of two water. thirds yeah. of the way through this challenge. No, actually, we're just coming up to the end of the challenge. Now then, they've done remarkably well. Ollie is sucking up the last of the water and he's finished. Liv, so about you? Well done. Right, so we're two. Th right, right, so we As you can imagine, there was uh, um, quite a lot of water going on in our kitchen this week. And then lastly, as, as I've said, um, they've got chance to do um, lots of different activities on the sheets as well. It also gave us a lot of uh, chance to have a chat and to look at Bible readings. Of course, we had a look at the book on and John 4, 4 and uh, we, we read through the Women of Samaria and it's got a nice simple explanation on the sheets as well for the youngsters. And it gave us an opportunity to talk about Jesus, talking to the lady at the well and why that was so strange because she was a Samaritan and a woman and that wasn't a done thing. And we talked about Jesus talking to other people about, um, about you know, well, people were from the margins of society and having a little chat about that. And also, but Jesus is 
the well of life. He is the water of eternal life. So um, that's a couple of ideas of what we do from the resource pack. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you, Paula, that's great. Thank you so much for all the hard work that goes into sending that out every week. It's really, really appreciated, I'm sure, by the families. And it's a great way for us to keep in touch with the children we miss so much during this period. So thank you, Paula, and everybody else who's involved. Thank you to also to Alan and Anne, who've been keeping in touch with the BB children as well. I know that's been very much appreciated. I've got some messages. Great. Well, thank you again for being here this morning, everybody. What I'm going to do now is, as usual, uh, put you into breakout rooms for 10 minutes. Um, it's completely optional. You don't have to stay at the end of that time. And um, if you're still around, then we'll come back together and say a final blessing.